And I want you to find the book of Haggai. That's in the Old Testament. It's a minor prophet. If you're not for sure exactly where that's at, just go to the book of Matthew. The book to the left is Malachi. Keep going to the left and you'll find Haggai. It's an Old Testament short book. And I want you to find chapter number one. I want to say hello. I'm probably confident that my parents are watching this morning if they're able to. And I want to dedicate the preaching today to my favorite preacher, my father. And I want to say to you that I love you and that we're preaching the gospel because of your counsel and your encouragement and your example. So did you find Haggai chapter number one? How many are there? Haggai chapter number one. And I want to preach today this message, and it's entitled, It is Time to Do the Work of the Lord. It is time to renew the work of the Lord of the Lord. Find Haggai chapter 1. We'll get to that in in just a minute. This is the sixth message. It's my final message in the series. Next week, Dr. Brown, unless the Lord leads otherwise, he'll be leading a service on revival. That'll kind of like be the conclusion of my series, but my end is today. And I want to lay the foundation very quickly so that you'll understand. In our series, we've been talking about revival. We've been talking about renewal or awakening, but we've been using the word reformation because Because reformation is perhaps the highest order of a move of God because it brings permanent, lasting change to the body of Christ. That's what we're praying for here at Family First. Not a flash in the pan, not a temporary emotional stir, not a periodic fling, but a permanent, lasting move of God. I believe there is a unique anointing in this house. I really do. We're not comparing ourselves to anyone else. We're not saying we're better than anybody else. But there's a unique anointing in this house that combines the anointing of the Word of God with the anointing of the Spirit of God. If you've never heard me describe that as a believer, we must have both oars in the water to row in a straight line. If we have only one oar, the Spirit oar, we're all emotional, we're all spirit-oriented, but we're going in circles. Or if we only have the Word oar, we're very intellectual, we're very studious, we're very knowledgeable, Knowledgeable, but we're going in circles. We need the Word and the Spirit to combine as an anointing that produces life change. And I've been talking about nine characteristics that I found in a book on revival put together by Wilbur Smith. And we've been using each of these characteristics as the basis for the message. Now, he gave us nine characteristics. That would be nine messages. We didn't do that many messages. So last week we took, or two weeks ago when I preached, we took three characteristics characteristics, put them together to speak one message. And we preached a couple of weeks ago, it's time to repent of all of our sins. And we had communion. How many were here for communion Sunday a couple weeks ago? What a wonderful experience we had in the presence of the Lord receiving communion. Today is the final two characteristics. I want to read them to you. Then we'll launch into this message. Characteristic number eight says this, revival always produces a new sense of unbounded joy and exuberant gladness. When there's a revival in our lives, it brings joy. Reformation brings glad. How many want some, some joy in your life today? Come on, let me see your hand. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need it too. Come on, punch them right in the ribs and, and say, you need some joy. You need some exuberant. You need some. You, we want an exuberant joy and unbounded excitement in our lives. And then the last statement is this. Revival is always followed by a time of great productivity and kingdom prosperity. So when you put those two things together, I want to talk to you about the fact that it's time today. It's time. Everybody say it's time. (laughs) What time is it? It's time. I don't know what time it is, but it's time. It's time to renew the work of the Lord. You see, it's time to press on. I believe that. It's time to work hard. It's time to be productive. It's time to be fruitful. It's time to get on with the tasks that God has called us to do. I know that it's been a wonderful summer. I know that during the summer we have vacations and we have trips and we have different things that we're doing. We have a lot of different activities that come along. But when we get into this season of the year, there's a return to routine. There's a return to structure in 
our lives. And I want to use that to capitalize on the fact that today, right now, in our lives, it's time for us to press on. It's time for us to do the things that God has called us to do and fulfill the work of the Lord. The foundation for this message in Haggai chapter number one comes from the fact that revivals all through the Old Testament were periodic. What do I mean by that? They were temporary. They didn't last forever. There were increasing times of pressing forward and advancing in the things of God. But then there were also periodic, temporary setbacks. And possibly the greatest setback of all was that because of the prophecy of Jeremiah concerning Israel's sin, the nation of Israel went into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Now, I don't know if you know this Bible history. Maybe you do. Maybe you should. But let me just fill you in. Because Israel had disobeyed God, God allowed the Babylonians to come in and capture them. They deported them to a foreign land and they became slaves. They became captives in a foreign land, the nation of Babylon. But God had prophesied that this captivity would only last 70 years. And when the 70 years were ended, God would bring Israel out of captivity. She would emerge victorious and move forward that time of restoration began with the decree of a pagan man who was the king the king of Persia and his name was Cyrus now remember that name because scripture tells us that Cyrus was not a good guy he was not an honorable guy he was not a righteous guy he was not a godly man He, he was not an Israelite he was from a pagan nation he was rather uncouth he, he was rather crude. He was plain spoken. He was a, a blunt type person. But he did have a pure heart. And he was a fair man. So in 539 B.C., He made this proclamation that all the Israelites, as well as people from other nations that were captives and held in Babylon, they could go back home to the countries where they were originally from, and that included the Jews. So in 539 B.C., actually 70 years to the year after they had went into captivity in fulfillment of the prophecy of the prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Isaiah, he said, said you can go back home now to your original country and this is outlined in the book of Ezra Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 says in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia so he made this proclamation now I want you to listen to this he was not a godly man He was not a worshiper of Jehovah, but the spirit of the Lord stirred him up and he made a righteous decision. And he said, Israel can go back where they are from because I have the authority to make this decision. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are a lot of prophecies that have come out in recent years that people make an analogy between King Cyrus of Persia and President Donald Trump. Now, I'm not going to go into that right now, but you could research that. There's a lot of YouTube videos that you could watch. There's a lot of prophecies along that line because the comparisons are very striking. Donald Trump is not particularly a righteous man. He's not particularly historically a godly man, but he's rather plain spoken. He's rather abrasive. He's, he's rather crude. However, I agree with most that I believe he has a good heart. He has a heart for the people, but I believe that as this scripture says, the Lord stirred up the king. The Lord stirred up the heart. And I got you to know that God has the ability to hold the hand heart of the king in his hand he has the ability to move the thinking of people that are in leadership and Donald Trump has like Cyrus basically said there's going to be a retrieve there's going to be an open door there's going to be an opportunity in America for the gospel to be preached I thank God for the religious liberties that he has stood behind. He has come out very strong in support of the church and in support of the religious liberties and freedoms that we have in the United States of America. And that's very positive. But what I want you to realize, though, is that Cyrus, this king of Persia, said to Israel, Okay, now you can go back home. And you can rebuild and restore your land. You can rebuild the temple. You can get on with the worship of God. 
In fact, I got to give you this. Isaiah chapter 44. Can you put that up? up? Isaiah 44 verse 28. It says that God who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purpose of Jerusalem. She shall be built and of the temple. Your foundation shall be laid. Isaiah made that prophecy a lot of years before it happened. And Isaiah not only said that a man would give Israel the right to go home, he said this man would give them the provisions to rebuild the temple. And Isaiah, many years before it ever came to pass, literally recorded this man's name and he would be Cyrus. How many know God is the only one that can write history ahead of time? And we call that Bible prophecy. And so the word of the Lord says that Cyrus said, okay, you can do that. Now, here's my point and connect with me now. History lesson is over. Everybody say, boy, I thought I was going to perish there in that history class. This restoration, this revival didn't happen all at once. It didn't happen overnight. It came over a period of years. In fact, as you study the Old Testament... Ezra talked primarily of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. And then Nehemiah spoke primarily of the rebuilding of the walls of the city of Jerusalem. But how many know there's something still that needs to be rebuilt? That's why Haggai comes on the scene. And now he speaks primarily of the rebuilding of the temple of the people of God in Jerusalem. Because by the time that Haggai speaks, and I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but you're smart people. Turn to your neighbor and say, yeah, I'm smart. He's never mind. But Haggai says in 20 years, this process has not been completed. We've been working at it, and this issue from Cyrus came 20 years ago, but our work is not yet done. So we need to get on with the work God has called us to do. The people had gotten tired. They had gotten settled in to their own routines. They were no longer in captivity. These were much better times. These were much happier times, but they got complacent. And so Haggai's message is my message. It's time to renew the work of the Lord in our lives. And I want to springboard from there and get into the message because Haggai emphasized four things. And this is in Haggai chapter 1. If you found that passage, leave it open in your Bible. If you're downloading the notes on the YouVersion app, they'll all be there. He emphasized four things, four ways in which the Word of God could be renewed if we would hear the Word of the Lord. But before we get into that, before I get into that message, I just want to make an additional application to our times. I understand fully well that in many respects in America today, the culture is a difficult culture to reach with the gospel of Jesus. I understand that as much opposition spiritually, politically, culturally, in a lot of ways. I understand these are not the good old days in that sense. I understand these are not the 50s and the 60s or even the 70s. This is not the Jesus days. We're praying for a new Jesus movement like Lou Engle spoke of. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the Jesus movements of decades in the past, but I'm praying for a fresh great awakening. I'm praying for a third great awakening, a fresh Jesus movement to sweep across our nation and we pray to God that that comes. But I understand we're not living necessarily in the Bible belt. South Florida is not necessarily the center homeland of America where everybody speaks the same language, comes from the same culture, has the same pre- presuppositions and thinks in the same background. We come from everywhere. We are a diverse people and there's a lot of conflict between the work of the Lord and what he has to do in our culture. I understand all that. But I also understand these are dark days. And the darker the days are, the brighter the light shines. Because Jesus is still the light of the world. And I understand that not a lot of people speak it in terms that you and I understand. They don't speak Christian ease. They don't say it in religious sounding words and phrases. But the bottom line is their hearts are broken. They are going through times of despair and anxiety. And you and I have something inside of us. It's a deposit from the person of the Holy Spirit. And if we can get past our tradition and our religion and our traditional words and phrases and connect with them on our own 
some level, we've got hope in our hearts. We've got hope in our lives. We've got something inside of us that can deposit into their lives and make a difference. How many are still here this morning? Say a good amen. So what we have to do is say, Lord, help us renew the work of the Lord in our days. Oh, I got to hurry here, but business as usual ain't going to cut it in the new millennium. Traditional methods, traditional processes are not going to accomplish what has to be accomplished in Spring Hill, Florida in 2020. It's got to be something better. There's got to be something new. There's got to be something powerful. There's got to be something that's from God. And if you think that I'm on easy street, if you think I'm getting ready to coast into retirement, if you think I'm looking ahead to the retirement days of my life, you are sadly mistaken because the next 10 years of my life are going to be the productive time of my entire ministry. And I'm going to speak it prophetically. God is going to fill this house. God is going to fulfill the promise. He is going to put a thousand people on this eight acres every single weekend because this place is going to be a place where the glory of God is manifest. To Hernando County, Florida. I'm in partnership with Pastor Omar. We've been praying thy kingdom come, thy will be done in Hernando as it is in heaven. Come on, somebody. So if we're going to see that, we got to get a hold of this message from Haggai. Now what I'm doing is taking a message and it's a historical message. It's a biblical message. But I'm going to relate it to today's times. How many are connecting on the, what I'm doing here? So here's four things. And uh, they all come right out of Haggai chapter 1. And I'll put them on the screen. They'll be easy to understand. Here's number one. We must refuse to blame the providence of God. In other words, we must refuse to fall into that trap of saying, Well, you know, if God really wants this done, God will do it himself. God is, God is sovereign. God, God is all powerful. You know, how, how do you know what the word providence means? Providence means God's divine doing. The providence of God is an attitude that kind of says, well, you know, whatever God wants to happen, it just automatically happens. Because, it, it, you know, because God, God just takes care of everything. And, and, you know, we said this a thousand times, but I'll reiterate it again. It's that mistaken attitude that God is in control. Now, I don't want to lose you there, but let me explain that. I understand that God is sovereign. What that means is God is large. And he is in charge. <laughs> he can do what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, anytime he wants. He's God. He's in charge. But listen to this. Just because God is sovereign and God is in charge, we are not to assume that means that God is always in control. Because human decisions often overrule the decisions of the heart of God. So look at the verse. Haggai chapter 1 Verse 1, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord, and I read all these names in the first service, and the people honored me for saying all these names. But look at down to verse number 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now I want you to listen. It's like Haggai is saying, these people are saying, well, it's just not time. It's just not a good time. It's just not convenient right now. It's just not appropriate right now. And it's almost like they were saying, and I mean this facetiously, but it could very well be the application. It's like they're saying, well, if, if God really wants his house built, he's God. He, he's providence. He's sovereign. He can, just, he can just do it himself. If God is big and if God is all powerful, and if he wants people in Spring Hill, Florida to get saved and come to Jesus and find a home at Family First where they can be discipled in the things of God, then, then God will just bring them. God will give them dreams and revelations, and they'll just show up in the the door. We won't have to invite them. We won't have to reach out to them. We won't have to go pick them up. We won't even have to be smiling and nice to them when they show up. God will just do it all himself. How many know that's a mistaken identity? Because we cannot rest in the providence of God, but we've got to be like the uh, word of the Lord that said to Haggai, these people should not say the time has not come to do the work of the Lord. It's like they're saying, well, it's too hard right now. It's like they're saying it's not the right time right now. Maybe, maybe in another era, maybe in another generation, maybe at some other time. And I want you to know just because it's difficult to do the work of the Lord 
And if you think it's difficult for you to live a Christian life, I don't mean this facetiously, how difficult do you think it is to lead a bunch of other people that are trying to walk out the work of God in their life? Pastoring a church in 2019 is a thousand miles different than it was pastoring a church five or even seven years ago. It's a whole different world. But we're not going to say the time is not right. We're not going to say, well, Lord, if it was easier... We're not going to say, Lord, well, if we had more money. We're not going to say, well, well, Lord, if, if the people just would show up automatically. We're, we're not going to say, well, well Lord, if, if you would just do it for us. Because we're not going to blame the providence of God. Everybody with me? Say amen. amen. So let's go on to number two. I'm going to move quickly. We must set priorities. Everybody say priorities. priorities. For the work of God. Now, this is a strong word. I never apologize for preaching a strong word, but occasionally I warn you when it's coming. <laughs> so here it is. Verse 3. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, where he said a question. Listen, is this question, rhetorical question. You know what rhetorical questions do? They get you to think. He said, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? While this house lies in ruins? Is it a time for you to just enjoy life? Is it a time for you to get on with the business of your own family, with your own world, with your own choices, with your activities, with all of your things? Is this a time for you to just sit in your pen? Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that God is opposed to having nice homes or, or nice houses or, or that God is against aesthetics. And the word there actually in the Hebrew is like wainscoting. And people have tried to imagine what that really means. But it's really an analogy. It's like that God was saying, you people have spent all of your time building your house. What about my house? And I'm not making the analogy of a building. Come on, get beyond that. It's, it's more than a building because the work of the Lord, the church, is not a building. The church is the people of God that are in this room. So it's like God is saying, all of your efforts, all of your time are building your own house, building your own work, fulfilling your own agenda, fulfilling your own vision for what you want to do for what you want to put your energies to but God is saying what about my work what about my house what about the agenda that I have and so the passage is a calling for proper priorities it's a calling that the work of the Lord must become first that the work of the Lord must be our highest priority that the building of our house should not take priority over building of the house of the work of God how many are still here say amen. amen say pastor coach that's not the kind of preaching i hear at the mega church you're right it's not the kind of preaching you hear at the me churches it's not the kind of preaching that you hear at the keep everybody happy churches so they'll keep filling the building and pay the bills but it's the kind of preaching you hear from the word of god that said us let us get our hearts in right with god because we must have his purpose and plans for our lives so priorities it's like God is saying, what's really important to you? And this is going to be strong. I warned you. Many today, many today. I'm not talking to you. I'm sure it's those other people that aren't here today. <laughs> many today are so busy building their own house, they're neglecting the house of God. I don't mean that we want to build a building. I don't mean that we want to, you know, panel the church and redeck. No, that's not my point. It's that we need to build the work of the Lord in this city. They're building their families. Oh, yeah, Lord, I'll say it to the best of my ability. There's plenty of time for every activity, for every entertainment, for every opportunity that comes along. There's plenty of time for every event on the family calendar. We're building our lives. There's plenty of time to do what we prioritize to do. We're even building our, our bodies. There's plenty of time to go to the gym. There's plenty of time to go to the movies. There's plenty of time to do this. There's plenty of time to do something else. And you say, Pastor Coates, well, you haven't mentioned anything yet that touches me. So I'll just allow that to the Holy Spirit. If there's any analogy there that I didn't give that gets your attention, I'll just allow the Holy Spirit to fill that into your situation. But what am I saying? 
We're busy, 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 and we're agenda oriented, and we're we're we're, we're building our own lives, we're building our own house, we're we're building our own we're, we're building our own futures, and and uh, I don't mean to be misspirited. I'm just trying to really communicate to 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 you in, in this heart today. And if you ask those people, well, would you do something for the work of the Lord? It's it's like they it's like they have an apoplexy. It's like they they go into convulsion. Oh, I'm so busy. I've got to do this and I've got to do that and my agenda and my calendar and my activities. And it's like, well, don't you realize that all of that activity? If the priorities are ahead of allowing God to work in your life first is not going to benefit what you're really trying to seek after. Now, let me put this in a positive way. Somebody say, Pastor Coates, I came for a positive word. So I'm going to spin this and you're going to get the message and a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down. So look at how, look at how Haggai said it in verse 6. Haggai says in verse 6, You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes in it. Do you see the picture that that he's painting? He's saying you're working so hard. You're trying so hard. You're so busy. You're doing everything you possibly can. But don't you realize that in all reality, you're really not making much progress. You're eating meal after meal, but you're not feeling satisfied. You're clothing yourself continuously, these analogies, but you're really not warming your body. You're putting your wages into a bag that has holes in it, and you're really not making any progress. And the reason is because of our lives that are not in a position of honor by honoring the Lord first so that everything else in our lives can be blessed. I told you I'm going to be positive. So here it is. Matthew 6 verse 33. This will help you grasp what I'm trying to teach. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all. Everybody say all. All All of this stuff will be added unto you. But if I'm trying to add all the stuff and ignore seeking the kingdom, I'm going to be spinning my wheels. I'm going to be putting my money into a bag with holes in it. I'm going to be laboring with a labor that does not benefit. Jesus said, John 6, 27, do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures unto eternal life. And it's because of priorities. I, I told you I warned you, so I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to deliver this, because if I don't deliver it to you, I'll have to take it home, and, and, and that's not good. So uh, just receive it. But when we prioritize, seek first the kingdom, what happens? God says, I will supply all of your needs. Seek first my righteousness, and all of these things will be taken care of. See, here's a principle. No one cheats God without cheating himself. I don't know if you understand that. If we put God first, God will bless us and everything will go well. But if we don't put God first, if we cheat God, we're really cheating ourselves. Because it is God that gives us the ability to be blessed and prospered. So it was a time, not only for them... To not blame the providence of God. It was a time for them to prioritize the work of the Lord. Here's number three. We're just going on down through this chapter. Haggai chapter one. Here's the third point. We must get involved in the work of the Lord. I don't know if I want to read all of this. Uh, I don't know if there's all of this on the screen. You can glance through Haggai chapter one. Verse seven begins by saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. 
It says, go up to the hills and bring down wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. And then it's kind of like it was previously. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain and on the new wine. The oil and the ground brings forth because man and beast and all their labors, because it's not blessed. Are you with me? Because it's not in favor, because it's not in the covering of the honor. And here's the verse that really says it. Verse eight, go to the hills and bring wood and build the house. Why? That I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Not that God would be blessed, per se, with buildings. Not that God would be blessed, per se, with a temple being built. But he would be blessed with the priorities of the honor of the people that work his principles in their lives. So here's the Reformation revelation along this line. If we expect to walk in the blessings of God, we must be called involved in the things that God blesses. If we want the favor of God, we must become involved in the things that God favors. So let me flip this. Everybody doing okay now? Okay. Turn to your neighbor and smile. It's going to get better. Okay. You swallowed your castor oil for the day. All right. You survived. You didn't think you could, but you did. So look at verse 12. Here's a wonderful, positive, encouraging verse. Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. Oh, this blesses me. What's it say? They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. What an incredible verse. All the people, the whole remnant of them, when he unburdened his message that I have just unburdened to you, what's it say they did? They all obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. As the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. So if we'll hear and if we'll obey, then God will give us direction. And here's where I want to conclude today. He will grant us an endowment. He will grant us an enablement. Because here's number four. Go ahead and bring this up. We must receive God's enablement to do the work of the Lord. If we're going to do this thing, we're going to get busy and prioritize and work our lives and serve God and let the kingdom and his righteousness be the first priority in our lives. We're not going to do that apart from the enablement of the Holy Spirit. But if we will commit our ways unto the Lord... He will give us strength. Are you with me? He will give us wisdom. He will give us favor. He will give us anointing. He will give us whatever it is that we need. And here's what it says in verse 13. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. Isn't that good news? I want you to know God is for you, not against you. He's on your side. Come on, everybody in the house, say, God's on my side. God God is for you, not against you. He spoke to the people, and the Lord's message was this. I am with you, declares the Lord. And look at what it says. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And I love this phrase. I want to emphasize it. And the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of the remnant of all the people. My goal, my prayer through these summer weeks, and this is my final message in this series, and I got a revelation soon about what I'm going to preach and teach in the next few weeks, but this is the conclusion to this process. My goal through this summer has been that the Spirit of God will stir up the spirits of everybody at Family First. We've been talking about a summer to remember. 
That God, the Bible says, would stir up your pure minds of remembrance. That God would stir up a memory. That God would stir up an expectation. He would stir up something to believe that God is going to do something great in your life in the future. And my desire is that God will stir us up. I pray that God will co- so come alongside us that the enablement of the Holy Spirit will enable us and empower us to do what we cannot do for ourselves and by ourselves. How many want to get stirred up? Can I see your hand? I'm totally serious. You you want to get stirred up. I don't mean to go crazy on you this morning. I was teaching on Wednesday night in the book of Romans. We teach verse by verse from the New Testament in the book of Romans on Wednesday night. And this past week, we ran across a verse in Romans chapter 9. I believe it's verse 2 or 3 of Romans chapter 9. And I'm paraphrasing it. Paul literally said this. Now, Paul was a Jew. He was not a Gentile. And his passion was for the Jewish people. God didn't call him to reach the Jews. God called him to reach the Gentiles. But it says in the first couple of verses of Romans chapter 9, and I'm paraphrasing this in my own words. It's like Paul said, if I would... Could, if it were possible, and this sounds dramatic, Paul says, if it were, now it's not possible, don't misunderstand me, but it's like Paul was saying, if it were possible for me to go to hell so that all the Jewish people could go to heaven, Paul said, I would do that because of my passion for lost people to come to Jesus. I'm asking for the Spirit of the Lord to stir us up. So that we have that same sort of spirit. It's not possible. I'm not saying it is possible. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. But that was Jesus. I can't die for you. You can't die for me. It's an analogy. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it's the principle. It's like the passion of our heart would be, you know, I would give up my life with Christ so that lost people could have a life with Christ if that's possible. That sounds staggering. That sounds dramatic. But that was Paul's heart. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will stir us up so that we get on with the work of the Lord. And you know how God will do that? Through the enablement of the Holy Spirit. I've asked the team to help me this morning at the end here. I had no idea until yesterday that... uh, Pastor Meredith was going to bring out that brand new song that she wrote about the oil of the Holy Spirit this morning. Wasn't that an anointed song? Powerful, powerful word. So I want to take you to the book of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah is the book that's right after Haggai. And Zechariah is a contemporary of Haggai. That means they ministered at the same time and to the same group of people. And Haggai is encouraging people to renew the work of the Lord. We've got to get on with the work of God. But then Zechariah comes along and he says, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to accomplish it, not in our own strength, not in our own ability, not in our own power, but we're going to accomplish it by the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord. And here's what it says in Zechariah chapter 4. The angel... Zechariah has a vision and he says the angel who was talking to me came and he woke me up like a man who was awakened out of his sleep and this angel said to me do you see it and Zechariah said well I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are all on the top of it, and there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl, the other on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered me, and he said, Don't you know what these are? And Zechariah said, No, I, I really don't know what this image is. If you go to the book of Revelation, you see that John 
on Patmos saw a vision of Jesus in the midst of his candlesticks. You remember that story? The sevenfold lampstands, the sevenfold candlestick, the menorah. And the Bible says that he asked the Lord, what does that mean? And God in Revelation says the candlesticks are the church. They are the body of Christ. So we take that same image, that same vision to Zechariah chapter 4. It's a little bit different because now instead of candlesticks, there are lampstands. Instead of wax candles, there are bowls of oil. And the bowls of oil are filled with oil that's coming from the trees, these olive trees, and these little cups that are filled with oil are providing the, the fuel for the illumination because the interpretation in the New Testament is that the church is the light of the world. But what is going to make you and I be able to shine bright as the light of the world? It's not the wax, but it is the oil of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I was going to say something earlier in our worship and I didn't, so let me say it right now. If you want the oil to flow in your life, you got to realize that the oil doesn't flow until the olive gets crushed. The oil doesn't come out until something gets bruised, until something gets crushed, until something gets mashed. And if you go through pain and sorrow and suffering in your life, don't waste your sorrows. But look for the oil that will flow out of the crushing and the bruising and the grinding that happens in your life because that's where the oil flows and if you'll ask the Holy Spirit to fill your cup fresh today with oil it will be fresh from heaven it will enable you to let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and they'll glorify your Father who is in heaven so I want you to stand with me Everyone in this room standing together. In fact, what I want you to do is just move up to the front. Can, can we have altar ministry here this morning? Come on, just, just move on up here to the front. And here's what I want everybody to do. I want you to just come up real close. I want you to stand right up close to the, to the steps. And I want everybody in the room to just lift your hands up to the Lord. Now you do it the way you're comfortable with doing it. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold my hand like this. I'm going to hold my hand symbolically as if this is my cup. As if this is my little bowl. As this is where I'm asking God to put the oil of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I'm going to say, oh God, today I come and I need fresh anointing. I need fresh oil. I need fresh enablement. Lord, I'm stirred up by what Pastor said today, and I don't want to just sit on the sidelines. I don't want to have Miss Bacon priorities. I want to seek first the kingdom, but I need the oil. I need the wisdom. I need the endowment. I need the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life to help me. Go so just ask Him right now, God, fill me up today with the oil of your Spirit. Fill me up today, God with fresh, fresh anointing, fresh, fresh fire, fresh, fresh joy. Oh, hallelujah. Just let the Holy Spirit begin to direct us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father.